Hello and welcome to Funk Prog Sweden, the fifth this year. Today's agenda, first an introduction by me, Magnus Sedlacek, and then we'll do testing smart contracts with QuickCheck by John Hughes. And then we do functional programming in C-sharp 9 by Simon Painter. And in the end, I'll go through the rest of the schedule and summary for this meetup. First, I would like to thank all the Beat for the video sponsor for this episode of uh, Funkprog Sweden. All the Beat is a small IT consultancy company in Stockholm, where a lot of developers are doing functional programming. So, <coughs> if you're watching this meetup and you want to support Funkprog Sweden, you can join the meetup community at meetup funk the Funk Prog Sweden com meetup. You can follow us on the YouTube channel and we've also gotten ourselves a merch store. So you can check out the store and you can get a nice t-shirt with the Funk Prog Sweden logo on. So you can check that out. It's everything is in the description links to everything. If you get questions during the presentations, just uh, either pop them in the YouTube chat uh, and I will ask them to the presenters. Or the presenters will pick them up or I will ask them. So, with that said, let's start the first presentation. I will hand over to John Hughes. Welcome, John, to Funkprog Sweden. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so I should see my slides in this um, on my phone, I understand, but I'm not seeing them. Ah, wait a minute. We see your first slide, John. We see a nice picture of you okay. in, the, in your profile. Yes, I'm not seeing any of my notes or anything. Well, OK, um, let's see if we can do this anyway. So <coughs> thank you very much for the invitation. It's nice to be here. Um, I am going to, okay. I'm going to talk about testing smart contracts. And uh, maybe I should start off just by explaining what a smart contract is. It's a small program that uh, runs on a blockchain and ensures that transfers of cryptocurrency uh, follow the terms of the contract. So it just makes sure that people stay honest. So the first blockchain that supported smart contracts was the Ethereum blockchain. And um, that has, that, that's what's special about Ethereum, and it's made it the second largest cryptocurrency today. Examples of contracts that might run there would be, for example, different kinds of auction or a crowdfunding scheme or a, a variety of things like that. Now, smart contracts are there to control transfers of money, basically. And that means that a bug in a smart contract could have serious financial consequences. And indeed, smart contracts on Ethereum have had bugs that have uh, led to substantial losses. For example, um, there's the well-known DAO attack in 2016, in which um, Ether worth $60 million at that time was stolen. So it's it's tens of millions of dollars that can be stolen at a time from some of these contracts. However, I'm not going to talk about um, testing Ethereum smart contracts. I'm going to talk about testing smart contracts uh, run by these people, um, a company called Input Output or IOHK, uh, who operate the Cardano blockchain. What is Cardano? It, well, it's the blockchain um, that supports the ADA cryptocurrency, which is one of the uh, 10 largest cryptocurrencies in the world. So when, when you ask what is the size of a cryptocurrency, you can look at its market cap, so-called, which is the total value of all the coins in existence at the current price. And at the time that I made this slide, then Bitcoins were worth a total of about a trillion dollars, and um, Ethereum coins were worth uh, uh, a little over a third of a trillion. 
And at that time, then uh, the total of all ADA was worth about $43 billion. So um, it was 25 times smaller than Bitcoin, but that's still enough to make it the seventh largest cryptocurrency uh, out of many, many hundreds. Um, so in, in fact, nowadays uh, it's, it's worth more. It's the fifth largest. Cardano is an interesting blockchain for several reasons. Um, one reason has to do with energy use. You may know that uh, Bitcoin transactions use an enormous amount of energy, more than a small country. And that's because the consensus protocol that Bitcoin uses is based on proof of work, which is very, very expensive. Um, and most cryptocurrencies operate in the same kind of way. Cardano is the largest cryptocurrency that uses something called proof of stake instead. And that means that instead of this huge uh, and frankly unsustainable energy use of cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, uh, Cardano transactions use, I think it's less than one ten thousandth as much energy. So much, much less. Uh, the Cardano blockchain performs transactions. I mean, it's just ordinary software and it uses the same kind of energy that, that any software running on a thousand servers might. Um, but it's not the enormous quantities that Bitcoin uses. And indeed, just a couple of weeks ago, Elon Musk uh, tweeted about the energy use of Bitcoin, and that has led to enormous ructions in cryptocurrency prices over the last two weeks. So today, uh, Cardano is worth uh, 55 billion. And instead of being 25 times smaller than Bitcoin, it's 12 times smaller than Bitcoin. So the fact that uh, they use proof of stake has led to a substantial increase in the relative value of Cardano in the last two weeks, but these things change from day to day, so I wouldn't read too much into that. So Cardano is interesting because it's energy efficient, but it's also interesting because it uses Haskell heavily. The entire blockchain is implemented in Haskell and the smart contracts are programmed in Haskell. And that makes it interesting to talk about here. So um, hopefully, Programming the contracts in Haskell may make them a little bit less susceptible to bugs, but of course, they still need to be tested. And that is why I have been working with these. Uh, our company has been developing a testing framework based on QuickCheck for IOHK. And if you look at the Cardano documents online, you'll find that among the tutorials uh, that are listed on this web page, is a tutorial on property-based testing of Plutus contracts. And that is using the framework that we have built and that I'm going to talk about today. So smart contracts on Cardano work a little differently from smart contracts on the Ethereum blockchain. So let me just explain how they do work briefly. Um, so the blockchain basically consists of a sequence of transactions. Every 20 seconds, a new block is created, taking all of the transactions that have been submitted uh, during that period. So transactions generate outputs, and those contain cryptocurrency, they contain money, and they can also consume inputs. And the inputs that they consume are the outputs of previous transactions on the blockchain. So all money is represented on the Cardano blockchain as the output of a transaction. And of course, you can only spend these things once. So money is represented by uh, unspent transaction outputs or UTXOs, as they're called. Bitcoin works the same way. Um, now, one extension that Cardano supports is that the UTXOs contain not just an amount of ADA, but they can contain a bag of amounts, a mixture of currencies. And that can be both ADA, that is the native currency of the blockchain, but also a currency that you invent for yourself for whatever purpose you may have. So um, that's those. Now, of course, a transaction isn't allowed to just generate outputs from thin air. Uh, so everything, every coin that appears in your output must have come from your inputs. So the blockchain ensures that the sum of the outputs is always equal to the sum of the inputs. 
you can't conjure money out of thin air. Unless, of course, you do exactly that. So that's also allowed. Um, you are allowed to forge new tokens in a transaction. So the actual invariant is that some of the outputs must equal the sum of the inputs plus whatever tokens the transaction forges. Now, of course, you're not allowed to do that freely. So you can't, for example, take somebody else's transaction output and spend it. And to prevent you from doing that, then every transaction output has a, what's called a verifier attached. And a verifier is basically a function that will be called when you submit a transaction and it'll be given your transaction to inspect. And then the function will say yes or no. It's not actually a function from transactions to Boolean, but it's, it's essentially the same thing. So all of the verifiers for the outputs you're trying to spend will run. And if any of them says no, your transaction is rejected. And that's how contracts enforce um, you know, that, that you behave as you should. And in the same way, if you whoops, if you forge tokens, then there's what's called a monetary policy, which is another such function that can inspect your transaction and decide whether or not you're following the policy. So this is the on-chain code of Cardano smart contracts. And these functions are written in a functional language. Uh, it's called Plutus. And it is a subset of Haskell. So this is part of the code that runs. But uh, you also have to construct transactions that you submit to the blockchain that follow these policies. And doing that is a bit of an art in itself. So um, the code that constructs transactions is also written in Haskell. So you can see here that there are two different kinds of code in a Cardano smart contract. There's on-chain code, which is typically very simple and is just verifying that transactions are following the contract. And there's off-chain code that can be a lot more complex that is your application that constructs transactions and submits them to the blockchain. Now that off-chain code runs in a wallet. And a wallet is just software that you run on your own computer um, in order to uh, make use of one of these smart contracts. So a Cardano smart contract is a combination of off-chain and on-chain code. And it's this combination of off and on-chain code that we want to test. OK, so how are we going about testing this stuff? Well, uh, the framework that we've built tests contracts through their so-called contract endpoints. These are things that the, the off-chain code offers in your wallet and you can invoke. Our test cases test contracts by performing a sequence of actions. And uh, every action may invoke a contract endpoint, and that submits a transaction to the blockchain that then gets verified by the Plutus on-chain code. One transaction, one contract endpoint could, could submit several transactions, and they all have to pass the check that the on-chain code applies. And then the next action may talk to another endpoint and, and do the same thing, and so on. So this is how we're going to test the contract code. We're just going to invoke its endpoints and let it talk to the blockchain. But of course, we have to know whether or not the code is behaving as intended. And to do that, what we do basically is at the end of each test, we check that the wallets end up with the right contents. That is fundamentally what smart contracts are trying to do. They're transferring money from one wallet to another. So we just check that whatever sequence of actions you run, the money ends up in the right place. So of course, we have to know where the money should end up. How do we know which wallets should end up containing what money? Well, we do that by modeling the state of the contract. I'm going to show you a sketcher model for you in a minute. Um, but uh, we start off in an initial model state. We know for every action in the test how the model state should change. And that's supposed to tell us something about what's happening inside the blockchain and the off-chain code. And one of the things the model will tell us is what should be in the wallets at the end of the day. Usually, when a test fails, 
when any quick check test fails, then um, it's not because of every part of the randomly generated test case. So in this kind of case, typically when a test fails, we may have run a long sequence of actions, and it'll just be a few of them that are the culprits that are responsible for the test failing. And I've colored those red on this slide. So the next thing that quick check does is try to simplify the test case. We call it shrinking. And uh, in this case, we'll end up with just a sequence of two actions that provoke the contract code to fail. And that's what then gets reported to the user. And uh, I really want to emphasize the importance of shrinking whenever you do property-based testing with QuickCheck or any other similar tool. Um, a randomly generated failing case is full of rubbish that has nothing to do with the failure. And it's not a good starting point for debugging. But the result of shrinking gives you a test case where everything in the test is relevant to the failure. One of the things I hope you'll take away from this talk tonight is just how valuable that is. So let me show you a simple example of a Cardano smart contract. And this is one that uh, IOHK uh, provide just uh, to show you what these things look like. This contract is a very simple guessing game. So the game starts when the first wallet um, provides lock some prize money in a contract. And um, in this case, the first wallet has provided 14 ADA as the prize and also a secret password, which in this case is the word secret. And the idea is that you can claim some of the prize money by guessing the password. So once the game has started, then um, another wallet can make a guess by submitting a guess of the password and requesting some of the prize money. So in this case, uh, the wallet playing the game guessed secret, which is not the same as secret, so it's a wrong guess, and asked for five ADA. And in this case, when the guess is wrong, nothing happens. But if a wallet submits a correct guess, then uh, the wallet will receive the amount of money that it's requesting and can also change the password so that from now on, uh, it's a new password that you have to know or have to guess to get the money. So this is the state that we end up in. OK, so a very simple game. There's one more wrinkle, and that is that um, in actual fact, when we start the game, the first wallet will also create a new token. And this is one of those special kinds of tokens that is different from ADA that I talked about. And we'll call it the game token. It's a new currency, and there's only ever going to be one coin of this currency. And the idea of that is to control who is allowed to make guesses. So in the first description I gave, any wallet in the whole world could submit a guess at any time. But with this extra restriction, you can only submit a guess if you hold the game token. So we also have to pass the token around to different wallets to enable them to make guesses. So what's the point of that? Well, maybe you might want to restrict who can play the game. Um, or I think more to the point, IOHK wanted to illustrate how you create and pass around custom tokens. So it's, it's really there to make the example a bit more interesting. OK, so I said that the way that we test these things is that we uh, give a model of how the various actions should behave. So I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about how we write those models, but um, let's just think about how we might model the actions of this game contract. And, and the most interesting one is making a guess. So what's the model of a guess going to say? Well, um, to model what a guess does, we need to know, is the guess correct? Uh, is it being made by a wallet that holds the game token? And is the guesser requesting an amount that the contract actually contains. So if all of those conditions are true, then the guess succeeds and the guesser the wallet should get the amount requested, the password should be replaced with a new one, and the amount locked in the contract should be decreased by the amount paid out. Otherwise, nothing happens. So this is what we want the model of guessing to say. But if we look at 
these conditions here, you can see that um, some of them talk about the contents of wallets. And every time we write a model of a smart contract, we're going to need to talk about the contracts of wallets. So this is some generic things that every model is going to need to talk about. But other things, like whether the guess is correct or not, or whether the amount requested is less than the prize money, replacing the password, etc. These are talking about things that are specific to this particular game contract. And so if we want to model the behavior of this contract's actions, we need to have a model state that tells us about the guess, the amount locked, and so on. So what we do in order to test this kind of code is we define a simple model state. We keep it as simple as we can, but it, it tells us enough that we can predict how the action should behave. And in this case, the model state needs to tell us what is the current password, how much is locked in the contract, and where is the game token at the moment. This is the Haskell code for specifying at the behavior of guess. Again, I'm not going to look at it in detail. I'm sure not everybody is a Haskell user. And uh, I realize that the symbols may be hard to read for non-users. But I just want you to look at the structure of this and see how it corresponds to that informal description that I gave you. OK, what, what's the next state after a guess? Well, first of all, we look up the current secret in the contract state and we compare it to the guess at the old value that is being made. And if that's correct, well, that's one step on the way. Next line, we look to see where the token is. And if the token is being held by the wallet making the guess, that's W, then, then we're holding the token. That's a boolean. Um, do we have enough ADA? We look at the game value and we compare it to the value that we're trying to, to withdraw. And then if all of those conditions are true, then we deposit the amount requested into the wallet, making the guess. We replace the current secret in the state by the new one, and we subtract the value from the game value. So it corresponds very directly to that simple description that I gave previously. OK, so now once we've modeled all of the operations in the contract in the framework we've provided, we can run the tests. And we can do that uh, just in the Haskell REPL. Uh, we call quick check and we give it a property that says that the contract behaves according to the model. And will it pass? Of course not. So uh, what happens in this simple case is that um, an assertion failed. We see the test case, and you can see here there's a list of actions. And it already looks pretty weird, right? What's happening here is that wallet number one is starting the game by doing a lock action twice with two different passwords. And it's clear that's problematic. I mean, which password should you guess now to get the money? It's very unclear. And uh, more output quick check tells us that the outcome for the contract instance failed. Uh, the contract instance stopped with an error. And it actually tells us that two outputs were found uh, when we only expected one. What's going on there? Well, it turns out that when you start the game, you actually submit two transactions to the blockchain. The first transaction pays the prize money to the contract. And the second one puts the contract into the locked state. And when you try and do that twice, both transactions paying money to the contract succeed, but the second transaction trying to lock the contract fails because it's already locked. And you end up with two unspent transaction outputs going to the same contract, and the off-chain code doesn't know how to handle that. It's only expecting one. So this is why we get this found two outputs expected one error. OK, so this is, I think, clearly a bug. If you try and lock, you know, start the game twice, you get into a bad state. But um, you can imagine that if you were to complain to the developer about this, the developer is likely to say, well, don't do that then. Why are you starting the game twice? It makes no sense. And this is something that we often find with quick check and property based testing, that uh, quick check will find cases that the developers never thought of and don't want to consider. And in that case, if the developer says, don't do that then, 
then we need to be able to tell quick check don't do that then so we can continue testing and what we can do is specify what we call a precondition for the lock action so let's just say as a precondition there must be no gain token yet so for the first action that's going to be the case and so we can lock but afterwards there will be a gain token and so we cannot lock twice in the same test and when we specify this kind of precondition which is an important part of the framework then quick check will no longer generate tests of that sort so will the test pass now of course not uh, when we ran the tests with this modification then we got this example instead and uh, here is the test case that we ran wallet 2 started the game uh, with a secret password hello and then wallet one tried to make a guess with a secret pass password hello and uh, you can see that um, the amount of ada in each case is zero that's what the zeros here represent and why is that well because quick check has shrunk this test case to the simple possible as possible example and you don't need to actually have any ada in the contract to make this test fail all we have to do is have wallet two start the game and then wallet one try to play so if we look at the error messages what come out uh, then we'll see that a bit further down uh, there's an error message complaining about insufficient funds okay well you might wonder why is that how many funds do you need to make a guess in a guessing game ah remember the game token you have to have it to make a guess and the game token is a kind of funds so if you don't have it you have insufficient funds does wallet one have the game token in this test case well no of course not wallet two created the game token by starting the game and nobody and has not given it away so wallet one doesn't have it that's the problem that's why this test fails so i think once again this is a bug I, it's wrong for the off-chain code to uh, stop with an error in this case instead it should just refuse to submit the transaction but um, once again you can imagine having a discussion with the developers and uh, we can work around this problem by giving a precondition to the guess action we can say the wallet must hold the gain token which was our intention all along so once we go through this process actually the tests still don't pass there's something else that uh, doesn't work and so you have to add yet more to the precondition to make tests pass but after a while we reach the point where we can run all these tests and they all pass and the contract doesn't crash and the money moves around in the, in the way that the model specifies so that's good but we realized when we thought about it that for smart contracts this isn't enough what we're testing is that if you make a random walk in the state space nothing bad ever happens nobody steals your money and of course that's important but it's not the only thing you care about where smart contracts are concerned we realized that for smart contracts you also usually have some kind of goal state in mind and the goal state might be, for example, a state in which no money remains locked in the contract. And you want to know not only that nothing goes wrong, but that it's always possible to reach that goal state somehow. Right? You want to know it's always possible to get the money out of the contract again. After all, if you end up with a lot of money locked in the spot contract, it's not going to be a great comfort to you that nobody else can steal it if you can't get it either. So we want to test that you can always reach this goal state, that something good is always possible. And when you think about it, it's hard to see how to test that. Right? We, can't, we certainly can't just run a random sequence of actions because it's unlikely that a random sequence will just happen to end up in the goal state. And um, in any case it doesn't tell you anything if you do a random sequence of actions and you're not in a goal state all that means is that you don't always get to the goal state by by doing you know anything at all that's no surprise 
So the question is, we want to test that it's always possible to find this yellow sequence that gets you to a goal state. But finding the yellow sequence is very hard to do automatically. So the approach that we like to take when something is hard to do automatically is to make the developer do it instead. And so what our testing framework lets you do is specify a strategy for reaching the goal state. And then we will test that your strategy always works. Let me show you what that looks like for this simple game contract. OK, first of all, how do we specify a goal? So here's a piece of test code that we can actually write. Um, this has no funds remain locked forever. And if you look at it, it says, first of all, let's do any sequence of actions at all. That's that blue sequence that I had on my diagram. And then after any sequence of actions, we should be in the goal state. That is, um, the funds locked in the contract should be zero. So there should be no funds remaining locked. The locked fund should be zero. OK, so now I specified my goal. This test is not going to pass, obviously, because what it says is, no matter what you do, you're in a goal state. And that's certainly not true. So let's see what happens if I give this property to quick check. Well, it's going to say, ha ha, it's not true. And here is a way to make it false or to demonstrate that. If you can look at this, you can see that uh, this was easy to find. It only took one test and two shrinking steps, two simplification steps. Um, and then we found that if you look at the red bit, um, after wallet one locks one ADA with the secret password all stars, then the assertion that locked fund should be zero is not true. <laughs> well, of course it's not true. We've just locked one ADA. But um, this just shows you what happens when you have a strategy that doesn't work. And what this shows is that the null strategy doesn't work. OK, so how do I specify a strategy then? Well, I just add a little bit to this property. And here is the actual code that I write um, to specify the strategy in this case. So first of all, uh, let's pick any wallet. I'm going to write a strategy that enables any wallet to withdraw all the funds from the game. Now, how is it going to do that? By making a correct guess, of course. And so in order to compute the correct guess, I need to read the current secret and the current value from the contract and then perform an action that says, OK, now I'm going to make a correct guess and then I should end up with all the money and there should be none left in the contract, right? OK, so now I've specified my strategy. Does it work? Well, we just give it to quick check. And oh, it doesn't work. And uh, if we look at this, then uh, we will see what's happening here is, first of all, I'm choosing wallet one to be the one to get all the money. And then wallet one is making a guess, should be a correct guess, but I'm getting a bad precondition error. Why is that? Well, that what's that te that's telling me is that the precondition of guess is not true. What was the precondition of guess? Let me just remind you, I had it on my slide. The wallet must hold the gain token. Let's go back to the example Quick Check gave us. Does wallet one have the gain token in this case? Of course not. We haven't even started the game. There is no game token. So it's no surprise that this test fails. But what it tells us is we have to remember that when we say after any sequence of actions, we're going to test this with any sequence of actions at all, including the empty sequence. So this strategy doesn't work at the beginning of the world. And, um, and this is what QuickCheck is telling us. Now, of course, this feels really stupid because at the beginning, there is no money locked in the contract. And so we don't need to do anything. So, you know, having a test fail in that situation feels kind of dumb. But what we can do is we can refine the strategy now in the light of the error that QuickCheck has shown us. And I'm just going to refine it by saying, only try to withdraw money from the game 
if there is some money there. Okay, so this says if the value of the game is greater than zero, then we'll make a guess. Otherwise, we don't need to do anything. Okay, so now it should work, right? Let's see. Next slide, please. Oh, no, it still doesn't work. Why not? Well, once again, we have a bad precondition. So if we look at the test case now, first of all, wallet one is starting the game, unlocking one ADA, so there is money to withdraw. Then we're choosing wallet two to withdraw the money. That's what that witness line says. That comes from the, the for all, the choice of which wallet. And then finally, wallet two is trying to make a guess. And QuakeCheck is telling us that the precondition for guessing is not satisfied. Remember the precondition? Does wallet two have the game token? No. Uh, and so we forgot something. Um, of course, it's not enough for wallet two just to make the correct guess. We have to give the game token to the wallet that's making the guess as well. So here is a correct version of the strategy. And I've just added another action to the test to give the game token to the successful wallet. And now this strategy will pass any number of tests. So I've actually now got it right. There we are. By default, 100 tests pass. I would probably now run 1,000 or 10,000 just to be, convince myself. So of course, this is a very simple example. And it's not a surprise to you, I'm sure, that this strategy works. Perhaps you might not have remembered, though, that you have to give the game token to the wallet that's going to do this withdrawal. So we believe that asking the developer to specify the strategy is not a hard task for the developer. We believe that people who write smart contracts know, or they believe they know, how to reach the goal state. But of course, in more complicated examples, it's easy to forget about a corner case or you know, to make some slight mistake. And it's that kind of mistake that can lead to money being locked in a contract forever. So there's value in just being able to write down the strategy that you think should reach your goal state, and then being able to test that no matter what has happened up to that point, the strategy actually works. This little strategy language that I've shown you is actually a lot more powerful than this simple example shows. Um, you can, for example, mix random sequences of actions with specified ones. Um, you can make random choices of actions in your strategy. You can supply weights to the random choices. This last one does action A two and a half times as often as action B. There's a very expressive little language here for writing strategies. And in fact, uh, this generalizes the whole approach to testing against a model that we've used with QuickCheck for many years. Um, a, a normal test just consists of a random sequence of actions. But by using strategies of this sort, we can custom that se customize that sequence in very many uh, different ways. So this framework we've built does have some limitations. We have more work to do. That's not a surprise, really. Uh, so of course, it's a limitation that we're only testing these contracts via their endpoints. It's possible that somebody might abuse the on-chain code by writing different off-chain code that talks to it. Now, we don't have anything specific for dealing with that. There's a mitigation, which is if you add some extra endpoints, some attack endpoints, that just provide raw access to the on-chain code, then you can use QuickCheck to search for attacks uh, of that sort as well. Another limitation, so far the simulator that we're running these tests on um, can't run multiple transactions simultaneously. If you have a contract endpoint that uh, performs several transactions in sequence, then of course, if two different wallets try and invoke that at the same time, you might get interleavings of the two. So far, uh, the simulator doesn't let us test for that. And here's another kind of bug that smart contracts can have that this testing doesn't address at all. Very interesting ones, information leaks. So the contract uh, that we lock on the blockchain has to store a secret password, right? 
in order to compare guesses to the secret. But if you store that password in clear text on the blockchain, you've lost your money. So you also have to ensure that you encrypt the right things, use encryption the right way. And uh, this kind of testing that we're doing at the moment doesn't address that. We have some ideas for how to address that, but that's, uh, that's for the future. So what really excites me about this is that um, not only are we figuring out how to test an interesting kind of application, but we have an entirely uh, novel extension to property-based general, property-based testing in general. For a long, long time, we've tested systems with state by generating sequence of actions and testing that nothing bad ever happens. And we found a whole lot of great bugs by doing that. That's the classic approach. That's testing safety properties. Now for the first time, we can test liveness properties as well. We can test that something good is always possible. And I think that is going to be useful, not just for testing smart contracts, but for a wide variety of different kinds of software. And that I think is the really exciting key idea in this talk. Okay. How long did I talk for? About the right amount of time. Yes. That's Thank great. you very much, Jon. Thank you very much. Very interesting. I've actually seen a quick check in action, but then we were testing for faults only. Find fault, find more bugs. <laughs> okay. <laughs> testing for the right state, so to say, or the gold state, as you mentioned. That's, it's, it's more interesting, actually. It's more interesting. I mean, it's also interesting that you actually can reach the gold state or the right, right state or whatever you want to call it. Yeah, there, there are lots of kinds of software where you actually care about this kind of property, yeah. that you, you, you never get stuck in a situation mm. that you can't get out of. Mm. And the goal might, you know, might be different kinds of goal. Um, so uh, it's, it's really interesting. I think it's, it's more for, yeah, it's, it's perhaps for more critical software that you really want to test this kind of thing as well. Smart contracts being a good example of that. Um, but there are all kinds of critical kinds of software where you, you want to test this kind of property. So exciting stuff. Very, very, very. I had uh, one more question. Plutus, I never heard of it. Is this something Cardano has invented or someone else? Uh, yes, it's something that Cardano have invented. Hmm? It is actually, uh, for those who are familiar with it, it's basically system F. Okay. Um, but what that means is it's just a simple subset of Haskell. Hmm. So what they do is you write your smart contracts in Haskell and you, you stay within this subset. And then they're taking um, the core syntax from GHC, the Haskell compiler. And uh, GHC always compiles down to system F, very simple functional language like Lambda calculus. Yep. Uh, and they're just extracting the parts that are supposed to run on chain and oh. transforming them into the on-chain code. How come they did this? Was this for like uh, for speed or for safety or for? Oh, it's for safety. I think so. They, uh, you know, if you if you look at um, the Ethereum virtual machine and the Solidity language that is used for programming that, then there there it's it's very complex and there are all kinds of vulnerabilities there, like the DAO attack that I mentioned. That that happens when one contract calls another and the other one calls back into the first mm. in an unexpected way. And when it calls back in, then the invariants in the first contract aren't true. Mm. Or you can break the invariants. And mm. that was how they managed to steal money. So uh, and that, that follows from the kind of very imperative nature of these smart contracts. So Cardano or, or IOHK wanted to have purely functional smart contracts. Mm. And these verification functions, they're much simpler. Right? They can't call each other. So one contract does not call another contract mm. in, in the same way. And that at a stroke, that rules out that particular vulnerability. Um, so they, they want them to be simple, predictable, to be able to prove things about them. And, uh, you know, I guess the what they're betting is that smart contracts spending your money for you are sufficiently critical that it's worth, you know, pulling in lots of programming language theory, 
formal methods, tools, mm. tools like quick check and helping people make really very, very certain that fingers crossed it's safe. their money is not going to be stolen. <laughs> yes, <laughs> of course, that's not what you want. I mean, I think that's the biggest fear. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, that's I would right. say, I mean, I think that's the biggest fear, yeah. Another question, John, how come you came into software testing and, and all this Husk? Uh, I mean, you've been on that board, I think, for Husk or the committee. Yes. So um, I took up functional programming um, as a, a teenager. Mm. I came across Lisp. I thought it was so cool. I wrote my own Lisp interpreter so that I could mm. write Lisp programs. It was dire. I found the code a few years later. I sped it up by a factor of 50 in two hours. It was so bad. But I've loved functional programming for a long, long time. Yeah. And then um, way back in 98, I think it was, uh, I just finished some big deadline. And you know how you go. Yes. <laughs> so I was in that state. I had a week with nothing to do. I thought, I'm just going to play. And I thought it could be fun to take, you know, equations and test whether program mm. satisfied them. Yeah. And I showed it to uh, Kuhn Klassen, a, a colleague at the time, I showed him the idea, and then he picked it up and ran a bit further with it and took it back and picked it up and we ran with that. And at the end of the week, we had the first version of Quick Check oh. and we were just doing it for fun. And I think that was, that was a key thing. So one, one disadvantage was that it was several years before I realized it could actually be useful. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but we did it for fun. Yeah. And um, that, you know, to be able to say, for example, you know, well, my function, it should be its own inverse. Hmm? And just give that to the computer and have, have an answer like that. That was something that we thought was really exciting. Hmm? And because we did it for fun, Using quick check is fun. Hmm? I think that's actually, you know, in social terms, it's one of the most important things about it. I mean, how many people go into work in the morning thinking, great, I can write some tests today. <laughs> no, uh, no. I, I know there, there are people who, who I love know, I know. Writing tests. I've done it myself, so, but I know that there are people, uh, there are more people, but not everyone. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, many, most people are. I find are not particularly enthusiastic about writing tests. No. What does QuickCheck do? It turns writing tests into programming that we all love. So you could have fun writing the tests, and then if you've got any bugs, they just come out like that. Mm. You don't have to search for them. So uh, I think the fun aspect is really important. Mm. Well, thank you again, John. Thank you. I will give you a digital applause here. Uh, thank you <laughs> thank very you. much for your presentation. It was very interesting. Um, thank you very much.